Welcome aboard. Welcome to today's tour. Today we are in Tennessee. We are at the Dyersburg Regional Airport in Dyer County, Tennessee. Today we are talking about and going to try to find the location of the 1963 Camden, Tennessee crash of a Piper PA-24 Comanche aircraft. That's the crash that took the lives of four of country music's biggest stars of that era. That crash on March 5, 1963 took the lives of four individuals and it is considered one of country music's darkest days. Let's get the plane started. We'll take a look around this small airport and we will get the plane in the air. The Dyersburg Airport here has the airport code KDYR. It's two miles south of Dyersburg, Tennessee, covers about 275 acres, and it has two asphalt runways. We have a lot to talk about as we make our way east from this location to Camden, Tennessee. We will locate the area where this tragedy took place and find out a little bit more about the victims and the events that led up to this crash. Our flight plan for today, as you can see here, is essentially the last leg of what would have been the last leg of that flight in 1963. From Dyersburg, which was the last stop that that plane made, and onward to what was the final destination, Cornelia Fort Air Park in Nashville. That complete flight for the plane in 1963 would have been this path, starting here at Fairfax Municipal Airport in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, it then should have went south to Rogers Executive Airport in Benton County, Arkansas. That's just north of Rogers, Arkansas and then on to Dyersburg, uh, where we departed from today, and then it would arrive at the Cornelia Fort Air Park in Nashville. If this is your first tour here, welcome aboard. What I do is I find interesting places uh, to talk about and visit, and then we fly to them here in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Today we are back in the Cessna Grand Caravan, the 208B. A small airport today, a quick taxi, buckle up, and we will be ready for takeoff. We are airborne. There were four people aboard that Piper PA-24 Comanche in 1963. The aircraft itself is a four-seater single-engine aircraft. And aboard that aircraft that day were country music stars Patsy Cline, Lloyd Copas, who was known as Cowboy Copas, Harold Hawkins, who was known as Hawkshaw Hawkins, and Randy Hughes, who was Patsy Cline's manager, as well as Cowboy Copas' son-in-law and Randy Hughes was the owner and the pilot of the aircraft they were flying in. Cowboy Copas was a very popular country music star who had been popular since the 1940s. He gained fame in 1943 when he became the vocalist for a band on the Grand Old Opry. He went on to have solo hits in the 1940s and early 1950s, and he had a little bit of a comeback to prominence with his biggest hit ever in 1960, Alabama. Hawkshaw Hawkins, was a popular country artist in the 1950s and the 1960s. His musical career started in the early 1940s uh, while he traveled the country with a band he had formed. In 1943, he joined the Army, and while stationed in Texas, he continued to perform at local clubs, but eventually was stationed in France. Uh, during World War II, he would end up fighting in the Battle of the Bulge. 
After the war, he would return to music full-time and would go on to sign record deals with King Records, Columbia Records, and RCA Records. His first two recordings with King, Pan American and Doghouse Boogie, were top 10 country hits. He would eventually join the Grand Old Opry in the 1950s and would record his biggest hit, Lonesome 77203, in 1962. And it would make the charts on March 2nd of 1963, just three days before he died. Randy Hughes, whose actual name was Ramsey, what was called Randy, was the pilot, um, and he was Patsy Cline's manager at the time. He was the son-in-law of Cowboy Copas, but he was a well-known recording session guitarist uh, playing for several country music artists, including Cowboy Copas. He then went on to marry Cowboy Copas's daughter, Kathy. He eventually went into managing artists, and in 1959, Patsy became one of his first clients. After taking basic flying lessons, he purchased this yellow Piper PA-24 Comanche, and he was going to use it to fly his clients from one show to another. He thought that purchasing the plane would be a good advantage for his clients, since they would arrive faster for their events and not have to depend on cars or buses for transportation. One of the main factors, if not the main factor in this crash, was the weather. Randy Hughes was a VFR qualified pilot, which meant he used the, uh, the ability to see the ground visually in addition to instrument to navigate and fly the plane. Today we're going to fly a bit of our flight with um, bad weather just to see the difference between flying in clear skies versus uh, a storm where visibility is limited and you really can't always see the ground. Patsy Cline, born Virginia Patterson Hensley in Winchester, Virginia, was a country music vocalist that is considered one of the most influential vocalists of the 20th century. By the 1950s, Klein was performing regularly at local venues and clubs, and then was asked to join band leader Bill Peer's group. It was the Bill Peer's Melody Boys and Girls, which played local shows, and Patsy became a regular with them. It was also Peer who suggested that she get a more appropriate stage name, hence she became Patsy Klein. In 1954, she signed her first record contract with Four Star Records. She recorded a variety of styles for the record label between 1955 and 1956, but none of them really became hits. Patsy left Four Star after her contract was up and signed with Decca Records. In 1956, Patsy received a call to perform on the Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts. It's a national television show that she had auditioned for several months earlier. Patsy had planned on performing the song A Poor Man's Roses but the show's producer preferred another song that she had recorded, Walking After Midnight. Klein initially refused, but ultimately agreed to it. And the producers also suggested Klein wear a cocktail dress instead of the cowgirl outfit that had been created by her mother, which had kind of been her signature style up until then. She performed Walking After Midnight and won the program's contest that night. The song had not yet been released. In order to keep up with public demand, Decca Records' Rush released the song as a single. The song ultimately became Klein's breakthrough hit. It peaked at number two on the Billboard Hot Country and Western charts, and the song also reached number 12 on Billboard Pop Music charts. The song has since been considered a classic in country music since its release, and it was the first to cross over between country and pop, changing country music as it was at the time. In the early 1960s, Patsy enjoyed great success on both the country and the pop charts. She also became a member of the Grand Old Opry in Nashville, Tennessee, solidifying her place in country music. Now with Decca Records, she released some of her greatest hits. I Fall to Pieces, which hit the top of the country charts in 1961. It also became a top 20 single on the pop charts, followed by another chart success with a song written by Willie Nelson, Crazy. A look at our progress here, as we can see not too far ahead of us, is Camden and the crash site. The events that led up to the crash would basically center around a charity concert that was being held in Kansas City. That Saturday night on March 2nd, 1963, Patsy Cline had played three shows in Birmingham, Alabama. Cline and some of the other country artists had agreed to perform at a charity event for the family of a well-known DJ who had died from injuries sustained in an automobile accident. Cline, Hawkins, and Copas were to perform at the benefit at the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall in Kansas City, Kansas the next day. This was for the family of a disc jockey, Cactus Jack Call, who had been in an accident and who had left behind a wife and two young sons when he died. 
The next morning, Klein and Charlie Dick, her husband, would fly to Nashville's Cornelia Fort Air Park in Randy Hughes' plane. There, Copas and Hawkins, who had played the Grand Old Opry uh, the, the night before Saturday night, would meet them there Sunday morning. So Sunday morning, Klein, Dick, and Hughes flew to Nashville. Hawkins and Copas took the short ride to the airport and met Hughes' plane there. Charlie Dick, Patsy's husband, would then head home. Kansas City flight proceeded without incident, other than Klein's complaint about how cold it was on the plane, and the performers arrived in time for the first of the day's three shows at 2 p.m. Despite having a bit of a cold, Klein gave three performances, one at 2 o'clock, one at 5.15, and one at 8.15 p.m. All the shows were standing room only. Her final song was the last she ever recorded that previous month, I'll Sail My Ship Alone. Klein and Hawkins, in particular, were reluctant to even make this trip, and they were both eager to return home. Klein was exhausted. She had spent much of the past year doing four shows a day at the Mint in Las Vegas. Hawkins had a baby at home, and his wife, who's also an Opry member, was soon to give birth to their second son, old Opry star Billy Walker, who had also been at the event. He was supposed to fly back to Nashville on Hughes' plane. Hawkins actually was scheduled to be on a 6 a.m. commercial flight. But Walker had received an urgent message Sunday night that his wife's father had suffered a heart attack in Texas and he needed to get back home as quick as possible. Knowing the commercial flight would be faster than the private plane, Hawkins gave Walker his airline ticket and he agreed to fly back with Hughes, Klein, and Copas. On Monday, March 4th, it was clear that it was going to be another long day. Storms had stopped all private flights out of Kansas City's Fairfax Airport. Billy Walker was back in Nashville by 9 a.m. to care for his children while his wife went to Texas, and Hughes, Hawkins, Klein, and Copas had to burn a day in Kansas City. Dottie West, who was another performer at the charity event, had asked Patsy to ride in the car with her and her husband Bill back to Nashville. It was a 16-hour drive, but Klein refused, saying, Don't worry about me, Haas. When it's my time to go, it's my time. Tuesday morning, March 5th, the weather wasn't much better, and everybody was growing impatient. Hughes made the decision to get back to Nashville by hopping from small airport to small airport and just waiting for the storms to clear ahead of the area for each hop from airport to airport. Patsy called her mother from the hotel and then at 12.30 p.m. she checked out of the townhouse motor hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. The group then traveled the short distance to the airport and boarded the Piper aircraft. At 2 p.m., the pilot Randy Hughes takes off from the Fairfax Municipal Airport in Kansas City with passengers Cowboy Copas, Hawkshaw Hawkins, and Virginia Patsy Klein. Mid-afternoon, the plane landed at Rogers Municipal Airport in Rogers, Arkansas to refuel. The flight is on the ground about 15 minutes and then takes off. At about 5.05 p.m., after making contact with Dyersburg Regional Airport, Dyersburg, Tennessee, Pilot Hughes lands there for a weather briefing for the remaining 152 miles to the Cornelia Fort Air Park in Nashville, Tennessee. Once on the ground, Hughes proceeded to the flight service station while Patsy, Hawkins, and Copas went to the airport restaurant. Hughes requested a weather briefing for the remainder of the flight to Nashville. The FAA person on duty was Leroy Neal, and he advised him that the conditions were marginal for a VFR flight. Hughes was only qualified to fly under conditions in which it was possible to navigate by sight rather than solely by instruments. It's known as VFR or visual flight rules. Neal again reminded Hughes that darkness would come early due to the cloudiness. At that point, Randy asked if Dyersburg runways were lighted at night in case he had to return, and Leroy told him that they were. Hughes then went to the airport restaurant and discussed the matter with the other three passengers. He then returned to the weather office to inform Mr. Neal that they had made the decision to continue the flight to Nashville. The Dyersburg airfield manager suggested that they stay the night because of the high winds and the inclement weather. He even offered them free rooms and meals. But Hughes, who was again not trained to instrument fly, said, I've already come this far. We'll be there before you know it. Randy called his wife from the airport and asked her about the weather in Nashville. She said, well, it stopped raining and it looks like I can see the sun trying to set. He told her, do me a favor, call the Cornelia Fort Airfield and tell them to turn the lights on. We're gonna make it in about probably an hour. 
So she called the Cornelia Fort Air Park in Nashville at her husband's request and asked them to turn on the runway lights for his expected arrival. The airport manager again reminded him that you'll be flying over a sparsely settled area where there's no lights that would be visible for VFR. Randy stated that when he made it to the Tennessee River, he would be familiar with the terrain beyond that point and would have no trouble. This proved to be a fatal assumption on his part. He told the airport manager and the FAA person that he would attempt the flight, but he would return for the night if the weather worsened en route. The airport manager would later say that he overheard Patsy Cline standing in front of the office say to Randy Hughes, if you want to stay, we will stay. If you want to go, we will go. But Hughes was adamant that he could get them home safely. Patsy was the first to get in the plane, sitting down in the left rear seat. Then Hawkshaw Hawkins got in next. As they settled in and hung up some clothes, Hughes and Copus chatted briefly, and then Randy took the pilot's position, and Cowboy Copus climbed in last. The aircraft was started. Hughes turned the aircraft. He received one more weather briefing by radio. The aircraft sat for about three or four minutes, and then next, the yellow Piper Comanche with green stripes taxied into position and took off at 6.07 p.m. A short time later, an aviation qualified witness about four miles west of Camden heard a low-flying aircraft on a northerly course. The engine noise increased, and seconds later, a white light appeared from the overcast clouds, descending in what he believed was a 45-degree angle. At 6.29 p.m., the aircraft crashed into a woody swamp area one mile north of U.S. Route 70 and five miles west of Camden. The aircraft was completely destroyed on impact and all four occupants were killed. Forensic examinations concluded that everyone aboard had been killed instantly. On our way to Cornelia Fort Air Park, we will take a pass over downtown Nashville, trying to spot both the Ryman Auditorium, which was the home of the Grand Old Opry at the time of the crash, as well as its current location. Downtown Nashville to the left, we can see the Ryman Auditorium. The Opry moved into the Ryman in 1943. The show's popularity really took off and uh, the lines wrapped around this venue to get into the 2,300 seat auditorium. Until the wreckage was discovered the following dawn and reported on the radio, friends and family had not given up hope. Endless calls tied up the local telephone exchanges to such a degree that even the emergency calls had trouble getting through. The lights at the destination, Cornelia Fort Air Park, were kept on throughout the entire night as reports of the missing plane were broadcast on radio and TV. Early the next morning, country singer and songwriter Roger Miller, who was a friend of them, went searching for survivors. He said, as fast as I could, I ran through those woods screaming their names, through the brush and the trees, and I came up over this little rise, and oh my God, there they were. It was ghastly. We will make our way now to the current location of the Grand Old Opry and its new venue that they moved to in 1974. This current location was the first venue built specifically as home for the show, the Grand Old Opry. It opened on March 16, 1974, with a capacity larger than any of the Opry's previous homes with 4,400 seats. Investigators believe that Hughes entered an area of deteriorating weather and with low visibility, he lost his visual reference with the ground. This induced what is known as spatial disorientation and eventually led to what is known as a graveyard spiral where the aircraft entered into a right-hand diving turn with a nose-down attitude. Looks like we have the airfield in sight. Let's make a bit of a turn here and we will be on the ground shortly. Now would be a great time to reach down and hit that subscribe button. It really helps the channel and I appreciate it. Tell us, Ms. Hensley, for whom did you pray? Arthur Godfrey's people did not want family to be there as a representative, so you had to have a manager. Well, I brought a young girl from Virginia, 
who is on Decca Records, Miss Patsy Klein. From Winchester? That's right. What's the name of her song? Walking After Midnight. And uh, Patsy Klein from Winchester, Virginia. You've known her all your life, have you? Uh, yes, just about. So they kind of fibbed, and my grandmother introduced her friend that she had brought along, and no one ever asked a question. Where did she uh, work professionally? Well, she is a regular member of the cast of Town and Country Jamboree, and she has made a personal appearance on the Grand Ole Opry from Nashville, Tennessee. Well, it's nice to meet you, Ms. Hensley, my neighbor. And here, through your kindness, is Patsy Klein. Honey, you done what? We are on the ground. Quickly find a spot to park and take a look around the airfield. This is where they would have landed had that flight in 1963 been successful in navigating that storm. 